back everybody if you grab your hymn books once again and turn to 352 please 352 we'll sing all three stanzas of oh the deep deep love of jesus if you found 352 stand with me please and let's sing it together Bibles and turn to the book of Exodus, please. Book of Exodus and find chapter 4. While you're returning, or while you're turning, I want to let those of you who do not know and those of you who read the email that I sent out that Brother Steve's uh, father uh, passed away. Wednesday or Tuesday maybe, I can't remember, but it was in the middle of the week. And uh, there's been a deterioration in his health. But he also, and I haven't gotten the complete details, there was a fire at his house and uh, he was burned uh, rather badly and thought that he would not live long and then sure enough he didn't. So how much that all figured in to it, I can't say. But the, the viewing is today and the funeral is tomorrow. And I had planned to go, but 
um, Brother Steve thought it was actually maybe better for me not to be there uh, for, I think, because of uh, all the religion that uh, will be involved. His dad was a uh, strongly Catholic, and so it's going to be at a Catholic church, and I don't think Steve uh, particularly wanted, uh, wanted me to be there, so we are not going not personal, just he didn't want me to have to endure it, I think is what Steve meant. So pray for pray for Steve. This is difficult for him. Anytime you lose a parent, very difficult. And his dad was a very outstanding man. All the all the Belogas are highly intelligent people. And his dad was a very uh, very intelligent man and a very accomplished man in a lot of ways, but gave no attention or attendance to the gospel that Steve tried to speak to him of. So we pray for Steve and pray for all the family. I want to read to you a few verses here from Exodus 4, and you need to mark your place because we're going to be in Exodus a good bit this morning. But I want you to look with me in the 10th verse And I'll set this in context when we come back. But I want you to see what Moses said as he prays to the Lord. So Exodus 4 and verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since you have spoken unto thy servant. But I am of slow speech, and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be thy mouth, and will teach thee what thou shalt say. And he, that's Moses, said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? And I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. Thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth, and I will be, and I will be with thy mouth and uh, with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. Well, let's pray together. Now, Lord, would you bless your word to our hearts? May we see Christ through the life of thy servant. Aaron, may we have an understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ that we've never had had before. May it be rich, rich and deep, and may it be enlightening to our darkened hearts and minds. We do pray for the whole Beloga family, especially for Steve and Teresa in this hour and in these two days. Bring them back to us to worship with us. We thank you for all of your presence and your help in time of need. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, amen. Thank you once again, Pastor. If you'll grab your hymn books, please, and turn to number 562. Be Thou My Vision. We'll sing all four stanzas together. If you found 562, please stand with me and let's sing it together.
waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling and I with thee one. Riches I heed not nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart. treasure thou art. High King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, bright, bright heaven sun. Heart of my own heart, not ever be fall. So be my
while you're turning in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, let me remind you that next Sunday is already, it seems impossible, but the last Sunday of the month of September. So that is the time for us to have our dinner together. And I believe it's been decided that it'll be chilly and all the fixings that go with chili. So next Sunday will be our day for our dinner and we'll partake of the Lord's table together. I ask you to always be in remembrance of prayer for each other. Pray for each other. Think about each other. Pray for each other. And pray that God will bless each and we especially pray for Brother Steve and Teresa and their family this week. All right, we're going to begin in the book of Hebrews. We'll turn shortly to the book of Exodus to look at a number of things, but I want you to look with me in the book of Hebrews. Now, one of the things that you find in the Bible is many times you find people paired up with other people. For example, we speak of Joshua and Caleb. You can hardly say Joshua without saying Joshua and Caleb. And when you think of when you think of Ruth, you think of Ruth and Naomi. They go together. When you think of David, David's best friend was a man by the name of Jonathan. And you may not think of it but too, too much, but when you think of Elijah, you should also think of the young man that was his protege, and that would be Elisha. In the time in which the children of Israel came back from the Babylonian captivity, there was Ezra the priest and Nehemiah the prophet. They both had their own work to do. There was also in that period, there was Esther the queen, but Esther the queen couldn't have done what she did had there not been Mordecai the Jew who was her uncle. When you come to the New Testament, you have Mary and you have Elizabeth. You have John the Baptist and you have Jesus. Jesus didn't baptize himself. John the Baptist did that. You move a little further in the New Testament and you have two brothers, James and John, were together. You have Barnabas and John Mark. You can speak of Paul and Silas or Paul and Timothy, who was probably his main, main supporter toward the end of life. But we're talking today about Moses and Aaron. So I want you to think Think with me about our text, which is in Hebrews chapter 5. So if you'll look in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 5, and what we're going to discover is that while Aaron was a great man of God, yet he was infinitely inferior, and Christ was infinitely superior, or infinitely better than Aaron, as great a man as he was. So today, we're going to spend a little time talking about Aaron. I want to make sure you understand who he is before we go further in our text. But I'm going to read the first five verses of Hebrews chapter 5. Here's what the apostle said. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So we come across the personality, the man of the scriptures that we're going to talk about today. And I want to look at Aaron under two headings. First of all, it's going to sound a little funny to you, Aaron the talker. So that's the first thing that I want you to know about Aaron. 
is he was a talker. And I want you to go back with me to the book of Exodus. So if you didn't leave your place or you marked it, you did, you did well. So go back to the book of Exodus. And we're going to look up several verses. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give you ten facts about Aaron. And then I'm going to give you ten ways that he was a type of Christ. So I have 20 things to talk about so you know that I have to move along pretty quickly in order to get this done. 430 years passed from the death of Joseph and the entrance of Moses. And Moses possessed many strengths, many, many strengths that he had. But he had a particular weakness. And we read it a little while ago. You know what it is. He was not a good public speaker. And so God provided his brother in his place, Aaron. And so he was a spokesman for Moses, Aaron was, but he was also a spokesman for God. And that's what we need to see. So I want to talk with you about ten facts concerning Aaron. There are more things that could be said, but I want to give you ten facts concerning Aaron. If you go back with me to Exodus 2, or if you'll look in Exodus 2, you will see in verse number 1 of chapter 2 that he was of the house of Levi. So he's really talking about Moses being of the house of Levi, but also Aaron being his brother was of the house of Levi. And if you were to look in the book of Numbers and the third chapter, you would see that the house of Levi, the Levites, uh, Levi was one of the sons of Jacob, and they were divided into tribes, those 12 tribes or 12 divisions within the total nation or the family. And the Levites were set apart in order to be priests. And so you might wonder, well, what is the work of a priest? The work of a priest is to stand between God and men. And what we're being taught by there being a priest is that you cannot go directly to God. That is an impossibility. We must go to God through a mediation, through someone in between, and that one in between is the priest. And that's what he's beginning to tell us in Hebrews 5, is that we must have a priest. It's going to be a long section in the book of Hebrews so that's what we're talking about. So this is the first thing he appeals to Aaron to show that there had to be a priest. So that's the important thing about looking at where he descended from. He was of the descendant of the Levi tribe. The second thing was, if you look with me in chapter 4, place of our reading just a little while ago. Not only was he of the tribe of Levi, Levi but he's identified as a capable speaker he's a talker and so it tells us that Aaron thy brother he said this is what God said to Moses in verse 14 the middle of the verse I know that he can speak well I know that he can he's able to speak well did you notice what he said before uh, here's the way God addressed Moses he said who made God's mouth I mean who 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 made man's mouth God is saying, I made man's mouth. So I can make one to talk, I can make another so he cannot talk. He's telling us that he is sovereign. So because some can speak well and some can't, it doesn't mean anything other than God has made one with that ability and one without that ability. And so he raised up Aaron in order to be that spokesman, uh, that spokesman for him and what we know is that Lord, the Lord made them both. The third thing I want you to see is still in chapter 4. And if you look over to verse 27. And that is that he embraced Moses. So you need to kind of get a little background here. Moses had come onto the scene. And he was raised in the house of the Pharaoh. Very strong, powerful man. But when he saw that the Israelites were being mistreated, he killed one of the Egyptians. And uh, he ran for his life, and he went to Midian, which would have been uh, far away. And he lived in Midian for 40 years. 
Moses never thought he would come back home, I'm sure. He thought that this was it. Midia was his home, and he married someone and had a family, and that's where he was going to stay. But God intervened into his life and brought him back, back over to Egypt. And so God needed to bring and did bring Aaron and Moses together. And so that's what we read in verse 27 of chapter 4. And the Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. Don't wait for him to come all the way to you. You go out into the wilderness and you meet him. And he went and met him in the mount of God and he kissed him. And may I say to you, is that not also a picture of where God meets us? God meets us in the wilderness. God meets us in the wilderness of, of our being lost. And he brings us all the way home. And so here is Aaron, been separated his brother for these 40 years, but he goes to him and they embraced, fell upon his neck and he, and he kissed him. Aaron didn't know that he was about to become such an important figure. He just knew that God had said to him, go out and meet your brother. And so that's what he did. And then the fourth thing that I want you to see is that he introduced Moses to the nation. Look down in verse 29. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did signs in the sight of, of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and they worshiped you know that they were glad that finally now, after 400 plus years, that there finally was someone, someone that might deliver them. And here are these two brothers, both of the tribe of Levi, and both of them being raised up, they believed of God, and so they bowed their heads and they worshiped. Well, the next thing I want you to see, which would be the fifth thing that I want you to see, is over in chapter 7. Once this story begins to develop, there comes the conflict between Moses and Aaron and uh, the house of the Pharaoh, and there are going to be ten plagues. Ten is the number for completeness. And there are going to be ten plagues that are going to be leveled against the Egyptians, and Aaron is going to be intricate to all of this process so if you'll look with me please in the seventh chapter and if you will look into verse number 19 this is the first of the plagues look in verse 19 chapter 7 and the Lord spake unto Moses say unto Aaron so it wasn't that Moses couldn't talk but just wasn't a good public speaker say unto Aaron take thy rod stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, and upon their streams, and upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood, that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in the vessels of wood and the vessels of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so, and the Lord, as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smote the water that were in the river and the side of Pharaoh and the side of the servants and all the waters that were in the rivers turned to blood. Now you people try to explain that away, but we believe what the Bible says. It wasn't just red, it was blood. It turned into blood. It was a miraculous, a terrible thing, but he turned this into blood. But there is Aaron. He is intricate in all of this again in chapter 8 and verse 6 and now they're going to be frogs in verse uh, 6 and Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt imagine frogs jumping everywhere all over them frogs and then if you look over in chapter 16 and 16 and 17 now we have lice, which would be the third of the plagues. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out thy rod, smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice. So the dust just filled with lice. 
throughout all the land of Egypt, and they did so. And Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod, smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice. And man and beast and all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. You couldn't, couldn't walk anywhere without nasty little lice getting all over you. So he's instrumental in the ten plagues. Then after they were released, so you go past the, the ten plagues, and uh, I want you to look, the, when they go past the ten plagues, they get out into the wilderness, and there comes a war with the Amalekites. So turn with me to chapter 17. And this would be the sixth thing that I said to you about Aaron. Look in chapter 17 and verse 12. And in this passage where they're fighting with the Amalekites, God has told Moses that he's to raise up both of his arms and hold his arms up. As long as his arms stayed up, they will prevail against the Amalekites. But when the arms begin to go down, they'll begin to lose the battle to the Amalekites. And so Moses, like any man, can only hold up his hands so long. So look what it says in chapter 17 and in verse 11. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And when let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. And Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and they put it under him. So he sat on that stone. And when he sat down, Aaron was on one side and her stay on the other side, both of his hands. One side on one on one side, one on the other, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited or defeated the Amal um, Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under the sun. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah is attached to several different names. This means Jehovah is my miracle. So what he's showing to them is they won by the means of a miracle. So there is Aaron on the side of Moses holding up his hand. Then the seventh thing I want you to see, if you'll turn with me to Exodus 24. He accompanied Moses to Mount Sinai. So in 24, 1 and 2, and God said unto Moses, in verse 1, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu, that would be the sons of Aaron, and seventy of the elders of Israel, which Aaron would have been one of those, Seventy elders, and worship you afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they, but they shall come not nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And go down to verse 9. Then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. And as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel he laid not his hand. Also they saw God and did eat and drink. And so he accompanied him to Mount Sinai where he is going to receive the Ten Commandments. Then I want you to look in chapter 28. And in chapter 28 we come to the eighth fact concerning him. And that is, he had special clothing. And it would be interesting for us to take time to go through all the different articles of clothing, but that would be a study unto itself. But if you'll look in chapter 28 and verse 1, And take thou unto thee Aaron, thy brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, Ithamar, Aaron's sons. Thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory and for beauty. So he made these special clothing for him, which was to set him apart as the priest among the people. But Aaron also wasn't a perfect man. He showed weakness. And I want you to look with me in chapter 32. So this would be number nine. He showed weakness. Number eight was he appointed uh, him a priest and he had distinctive clothing. Number nine is he showed weakness. 
Moses is on Mount Sinai and he's receiving the Ten Commandments. They didn't know how long he would be up there, but he was gone a lot longer than what the people thought. He was up there for 40 days. And so the people became weary and they became uh, upset and they began to murmur. And so in verse 1, and the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount and the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not or know not what has become of him. Now what you want is Aaron to say, no, that we cannot do. You want him to put his foot down. He is a good talker, but he's not that strong. So here's what he said. Verse 2. Break off all the gold earring, earrings, which in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters, and bring them unto me. And the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before them. And Aaron made proclamation, and he said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. What about that? What about that? They've taken, they've taken something that is from the earth, gold, They've fashioned it into an idol. But they're going to try to make a hybrid religion out of it. And they're going to say, this is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings. And brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink. And to rose up to play. So they took idolatry and tried to combine it together. And pour o Aaron. He assisted in their apostasy. The first thing that man does is become an idolater. Idolatry is natural to us. That is man's natural religion. And when you depart from grace conditioned on Christ alone, justification conditioned on Christ alone, election conditioned on Christ alone, there's nowhere to go except to idolatry. However, he showed strength. I want you to look with me to Leviticus chapter 10. I don't want to leave Aaron in a bad spot, so I want you to look with me over to the book of Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And I want you to look in chapter 10. You have to turn a lot of pages to get to these various places, but look in verse 1. He did show strength. And of Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire. By strange fire, it means fire that came from a place that God didn't intend for it to come from. It was supposed to come from under the altar. But they said, just any old fire will do. And so... They took that strange fire. It says in verse 2 that went out and there went out from the Lord and devoured them, killed them. And they, de they died right before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is their daddy, this is it that the Lord spake. I will be sanctified in them that come nigh to me and before all the people and I will be glorified. Here's his strength. Aaron held his peace. That's his strength. He wanted to, he bound to want to argue with God, fuss with God. Why did you do that? Why didn't you give him a second chance? But he held his peace. So that showed his strength. Now, Aaron the talker, let me talk with you about Aaron the type of Christ. I've got to move quickly. Not in his personal character, but his office as a priest. 
I'm just going to give these to you. We won't look all these things up. So I'll just give these to you. First of all, as a high priest, he wore beautiful clothing. And what it tells us in Exodus 28, verse 2 and 3, it was for glory and beauty and wisdom. And this prefigured Christ's glorious person. It also says in that passage, number two, to consecrate him or to sanctify him. And that means to set apart. And this prefigured Christ who was sanctified or set apart for his work. He came into this world for a particular work. And that work had to be accomplished or he wasn't God. So that's the first thing. He wore beautiful clothing set apart to picture him for, as Christ. Second thing, as high priest, he was anointed with oil. We read of that in Leviticus chapter 8 and verse 12. And this is a picture of the Holy Spirit upon Christ. Oil in the scripture is a type of Christ. As it says in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So Christ was not upon this earth by himself. The Spirit of God was upon him. And he was upon me, he said, to preach the gospel. So the Spirit of God was upon him. So that oil upon Aaron was a type of the Spirit of God upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the third thing. As a high priest, he put his hands on the head of the sacrifice's head. So they took a goat, and they took that goat and brought him to be sacrificed. And before he was sacrificed, he laid his hands upon him. Now, you know what that's a picture of, well as I do. That pictured the imputation of sin to the scapegoat. And who was our scapegoat? That's Christ. Where was our sin put? Our sin was put upon Christ in the most literal and real and actual sense. God took the sin of his people when Christ was sacrificed and put it to the body and the soul of Christ, he didn't become a sinner, but he came inseparable from the sin. And so God looked upon him and he was the scapegoat, the bearer of the sin of his people by imputation. That's what that's a picture of. Here's the fourth thing that I want you to see. As a high priest, he offered a sacrifice. In Leviticus 3 and 2 and 16 11, and this prefigured propitiation. Propitiation, such an important doctrine, and throughout the Old Testament it's called an atonement. But he offered that sacrifice, and it prefigured the pre propitiation of Christ. Tells us that Christ was set forth to be the propitiation, and that is the satisfaction. Here's the fifth thing I want you to see. As high priest, he sprinkled blood up on the mercy seat. In Leviticus 3, 2 and following, and also in chapter 16 and 14 and following, sprinkled upon the mercy seat. Won't take time to describe the mercy seat, but that's that place of gold setting up on the Ark of the Covenant. And what did that prefigure but the imputation of righteousness? So blood was sprinkled upon that, upon that mercy seat, and that is a picture of righteousness being sprinkled upon his people. So righteousness covered his people. So you have both imputations. You have the imputation of sin to Christ and the imputation of righteousness to his people. Here's the sixth thing. As priest, he entered the Holy of Holies in chapter 16, 12 to 14. And this prefigured a finished reconciliation. He couldn't go in there until the sacrifice was made and the blood was sprinkled. And only then could he go in the Holy of Holies. And that is because reconciliation was finished. As Christ could not enter into heaven until he could announce from the cross, Tetelestai, it is finished. Number seven, as high priest, he wore stones Twelve stones upon his breast. Those twelve stones typified the twelve tribes of Israel. This prefigures the definite redemption. That's in Exodus 12 and 21. It was, wasn't for everybody. It was for those twelve tribes. 
And notice that it was upon the breast, which is near the heart and the place of love. So by his love, God, through Christ, entered into that place of redemption for his people. Number eight, as high priest, he inquired of Jehovah for Israel. That was the work of a priest, and that is the prefiguring of effectual intersection, intercession in Exodus 28 and verse 30. Number nine, as high priest, we have one of those in usual things, the rod budded. You remember that rod that he had, and that's in number 17 in verse 8, and that is a picture of life, prefiguring life that would come by Christ. Jesus said, I'm come that they might have life. He didn't come to bring us death. He came to bring us life. And number 10, as high priest, he was fallible and temporary. In Numbers chapter 20 and in verse 28, that's exactly what it tells us about him that he was temporary. His clothes were taken off at the end of his life. Those priestly clothes, God said, take them off. And so Moses took those priestly clothes off of his brother. He didn't take them off. Moses took them off. He took them off, and it wasn't long after that, Aaron died. But I want to end up in the book of Hebrews. So I want you to go back with me to Hebrews, back to our text, and we'll... We'll finish it up. I want you to see just a couple of things, and I'll stop. Look, first of all, in chapter 4. This is a picture of Christ in that Aaron was sinful, but Christ was sinless. We have a high priest, 415, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. We had to have a sinless priest. The idea that Jesus could be a sinner is the very opposite of what the Scripture teaches. Had to have a sinless priest. Second of all, if you look with me in chapter 7, in verse 16, we had to have an eternal priest. Look what it says in verse 16. It's talking about Christ who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. He had to be eternal. Here's the next thing I want you to see. If you look in chapter 9, in verse 24, For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are figures of the true. Every place that Aaron went, it was temporary, and he was a figure of the true. That's all he was, a figure of the true. And then in chapter 10 and verse 1, he was a shadow of good things to come. Now that good thing that he's talking about, that good thing from whom would come good things was Christ and his effectual intercession. We have seen Aaron, God's talker and spokesman. We have seen Aaron, a type of Christ. You know what the name Aaron means? It means shine or enlighten. Temporarily, he shined light on Moses. Typically, he shines light on Christ. For we look to Aaron, we look to Moses, but oh my, we look beyond them and we look to Christ because that is his name. He is to show us Christ. Brethren, I say to you, look to Christ, the one true and only high priest, the only one who has a righteousness that was worked out, God accepted and God reckoned. Look to that righteousness outside of yourself and look to Him and to Him alone. We sometimes sing more about Jesus, what I know, more of His grace to others show, more of His saving fullness see, more of His love who died for me. We're going to sing four verses on the chorus one time. It's number 560 in your book. Would you stand, please? All four verses and then the chorus, 560. Number 560, let's stand together, please. <coughs> Jesus would I know more of his grace to others. 
show more of his saving fullness see more of his love who died for me more about jesus let me learn more of his holy will discern spirit of god my teacher be showing the things of christ to me more about jesus in his word hold in communion with my lord hearing his voice in every line making each faithful saying mine more about jesus us on his throne riches in glory all his own more of his kingdom sure increase more of his coming prince of peace more more about jesus more more about jesus more saving fullness see more of his love who died for me have a great week